Attention all Class D personnel. Please enter the containment chamber. Please approach SCP-173 for testing. <laughs> Greetings humans and welcome once again to this side of the woods. Today I bring you yet another YouTube quote unquote exclusive video, this time about a completely different game than I did last time. This time we're going to be talking about Crying Sons. So a little bit inspired by what I did on The Fall, the last game I played on my channel, I have also been playing Crying Sons on my Twitch channel and I decided to do something similar with it. Now, I think that Crying Sons has a load of content to cover because it's quite lore heavy, to be honest. So I will, instead of making a single video like I did with The Fall, I am going to instead make a small series of different videos explaining the lore little by little, probably sector by sector, as each sector, or uh, each cluster rather, shows a different part of the story. So uh, I will probably cover it cluster by cluster. But before we get to that, I wanted to make a few introductory videos explaining some stuff that is kind of global for every cluster. So before I get started, I wanted to make this small video really explaining if, uh, in basically explaining what this game is and showing my humble opinion of whether this game is worth it or not. So uh, with that said, I will first say what we're going to cover in this video. So first of all, we will have a look at what this game is, then we will talk about what this game is about, and finally I will give you my opinion about the game and if it's worth it or not. So uh, just in case, since usually lore videos have spoilers, I would usually make a small spoiler alert here, however what we are going to cover in this video has no spoilers whatsoever, it's just the basic information that you can mostly find in the websites and the different pages that talk about the game. So we are not going to be delving into spoiler territory just yet. This video is free to watch if you are considering playing the game and don't want to be spoiled. It's totally fine to watch this video. So that said, let's get started. So first of all, what is this game? Well, following the source of Crying Sun's official webpage, we can define this game as a tactical roguelite game, where we take the role of a space fleet commander that explores the mysterious falling apart empire. It's very story rich and inspired by Dune and Foundation. Each successful run will uncover more of the story. So first of all, we are going to talk a little bit about what this means. So first of all, you might have probably said roguelite. Uh, do you mean roguelike? No, I said roguelite on purpose. You see, there actually is a difference. This is actually something that I learned uh, while playing this game, because in my head I thought they were the same thing, or I thought that it was a mistake and that they had written it wrong. So I actually researched it and I found this article in Screen Rant that actually explained the difference between roguelite and roguelike. So first of all, it's important to mention that roguelike and roguelite are usually used in the same sense. Uh, to say it somehow, we basically tend to say roguelike to refer to both of these types of games. However, as I said, there's actually a difference. The difference was established in 2008, when a development conference created what is now called the Berlin Interpretation. The Berlin inter Interpretation established eight important properties that a roguelike game has to have. So the first property is that the map is randomly generated, death is permanent, so there is permadeath, the combat is turn-based, there will be grid-based movement, there will also be complexity to allow multiple solutions, non-modal, meaning that all actions can be performed at any time, there will be resource management, 
And finally, the combat will be in hack and slash style. So, for a game to qualify as a roguelike game, it must cover each and every one of these eight properties. If any of these properties is modified or directly not taken into account, this game is no longer considered a roguelike. So, what is the name given to these games? Roguelite. So, roguelite games are basically games that follow some of these rules, so they are very similar to what a roguelike would be, but they break some of them, meaning that they don't really qualify to be one. It's totally normal for lots of these games to appear, since, after all, usually uh, creating a video game is a creative process, so you're just going to make the game the way you feel it should be and you're probably not going to listen to some, let's say, quote-unquote, norms or rules that other people have set. It's your game, it's your rules, you decide how to make it. So basically, the roguelite category allows for this freedom. So let's go back a little bit and continue looking at different points. So the tactical word in front of roguelite makes reference to the combat because it's a little bit more tactical combat and it has a little bit more strategy involved than it would in a normal roguelike game. So usually roguelike game you just go through a, cer a certain set of steps or uh, floors or levels or whatever they're called and you just you know clear the entire area of enemies. There really is not that much strategy to it, you must just memorize what the enemy patterns do and fight against them. However, in this game, it has a little bit of strategy involved. Each combat will be different and you will have to learn what your enemy does and think ahead of what you're going to do so that you know you can actually defeat them and you do not perish in your attempt. So, as we were saying, we do take the role of Space Fleet Commander. We will go into details about that when we talk about what the game is about and we are indeed exploring a space environment. So the game is kind of set in a space theme and in the future. So we can expect that if we like that type of games, this is probably going to be right up our alley. So indeed, the story is very, very rich. In fact, I would say the story is probably the main part of this game. Roguelike games usually do have a very rich story, mind you, but this one does really put a quite good focus on it. And as a matter of fact, I just wanted to mention it. This game has done a beautiful work actually managing the game mechanics with the game story. We will have a look a little bit more into detail about this when we talk about what the game is about. But for you to have an idea, one of the roguelike or one of the Berlin interpretation elements that this game does follow is permadeath. How do they justify that? Oh, you're a clone of your former self. So yeah, that, that makes sense in this universe. Every time you die, you, you just come back as a clone. That kind of explains the whole permadeath situation and why everything continues to loop. So that's just a little example on how good they have actually used the story to justify the different game mechanics and just haven't thrown them at the user and expected them to just go along with it. They're inspired by other games such as Dune and Foundation and of course, as we all know, being so story rich and following the whole random map generation part, every time we play the game we will probably find out something new. So this game has a lot of playability. So that said, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about what the story is. So, what is this game about? As I mentioned at the beginning, this part is not going to have spoilers, because we are just going to discuss information that we can find in the official website, which of course would not include spoilers for their own game, and we are also going to discuss information that we have seen in the initial cutscenes. So we are not really going to, you know, show anything that might be spoilery, as the story that I am going to discuss here is what you would see in the first few minutes after opening the game. So that said, let's go ahead and talk about what the hell is going on in this game. So first, we can clearly see that this game is set in the future, as I did mention a little bit before. In fact, it is approximately about 800 years in the future. So it is kind of a, let's say, realistic world, to say it somehow. 
but just like in an in a kind of future. So with that in mind, what has happened or what is the background of this? There is this huge empire that was created 700 years before the game starts that has been ongoing for that time. It is a very powerful em empire that has controlled the entire galaxy for all those years in, without any type of opposition. So the game starts with the initial cutscene showing us what is a very, very interesting looking place full of capsules and people inside those capsules, which we can guess are either frozen or just in, state, in stasis of some sort. We will very soon learn that this is actually the cloning pan, plant in Gehenna. So after this initial cutscene, we get to see a very weird tentacle looking creature getting over to one of the capsules examining it and after a while opening it releasing the person that's inside this person is the player is the player's character and it is admiral idaho so admiral idaho wakes up and starts asking questions like where am i what is this who are you so the creature that uh, revived us is actually caliban who is not a creature at all he is actually a machine an omni to be more precise and he explains a lot about the story that we are going to be using in this first part. So he explains that you are one of the most renowned and best known admirals that the Empire has ever had. In fact, you are the very best admiral that the Empire ever had. So he explains that you are currently in Gehenna, a planet that is very, very, very far away from the Imperial capital. The reason why it's there is because it is a very secret base. So cloning was actually forbidden by the Empire almost at the beginning of its creation to, of course, avoid possible uprisings or possible weaponizing of specifically important people. However, the Empire itself, creating this rule, was the first one to break it, creating this secret location so far away. Of course, there was a reason for this. This was in case of the Empire going wrong or something bad happening to the Empire. So Caliban explains shortly after that the reason why he has awoken you is precisely because one of those states of emergencies has actually happened. So he explains that even though this facility was super secret, the Empire would send a message every year to this station to ensure that everything was going well as well as to use a certain type of ping or to give a sign that they were still going as it should be. However, for over 20 years, the station had not received this standard issued message. This made Caliban wonder what the hell was going on and he decided to revive Idaho, being the best admiral the Empire had ever had, to get on a ship and travel all the way to the central cluster of the Empire and find out what had happened. So after he explains this a little bit, we decide to in fact embark our ship, which is there built in Gehenna, and with our crew, which is of course consisted of other clones that were created here in Gehenna. So once we get our starship, we move to the next or first sector. Now, as soon as we enter the first sector, we clearly see that something has happened. Something very bad. In fact, we very soon learn that this empire actually was mostly running on technology such as Caliban, on Omnis. However, for some reason, 20 years back, the Omnis suddenly shut down. So, with this in mind, we now have a very specific target. Our target is to reach the central cluster of the Empire, the capital of the Empire, and find out what happened so that all these Omnis shut down, causing the Empire that had been lasting for 700 years to collapse in just mere seconds. Now that we have had a look at what this game is and what this game is about, comes the big question. Is this game worth it? In my humble opinion, absolutely. I have been streaming this game for some time on my channel. I, of course, already finished it, so I am not streaming it anymore. 
But when I was actually streaming it, I was looking forward to getting to stream because that would mean that I would advance in the story. So that's how much the story actually did engulf me and how much I want to go back to it. The game is, as I said, very rich in story and the story is actually very engaging. You want to find out more of what happened. I have found out that this game has done something like this in a very special way. It actually tells you the story non-stop. It never stops telling you the story. It's just throwing story at you continuously, but it does it in such a way that you never really know what else is going to be, so it wants you to look for more. So it is a very, very good way that they've done to engage the player in the story. So <laughs> that is probably the main drive that I've had to, to wanting to play the story. The combat mechanics were actually something that initially, before I even started playing the game, kind of pulled me off playing it at the beginning because I wasn't really sure if I was going to be very much into this game uh, combat me mechanics. However, I am actually very glad that I decided to ignore my initial idea and played the game anyways. So yeah, of course these combat mechanics are not the typical combat mechanics that you would get in a roguelike game. That is, those are two of the properties that this game has completely ignored of the Berlin, of the Berlin interpretation. So the first one is, this game is not hack and slash at all. You're using spaceships and guns, so there is no hack and slash here. And the second part is turn-based. There is, up to a certain point, a little bit of turn-based in this, but not really that much. So since it's not really turn-based, we can't consider it turn-based at all. It has completely violated these two rules of the Berlin interpretation. So being used to different games or roguelite games that had something that was more similar to roguelike, I wasn't really sure what I would feel about these combat mechanics. However, the way they did it actually worked out very well for the game. So yeah, it does use a grid and it does look a little bit like, oh, what, what's this type of tactical combat over, you know, uh, top-down view of like space fights. It does look a little bit weird when you look at it for the first time. However, you just need to play a little bit of it and you actually say, hey, this actually works out very well for this type of game. So that is one thing that did put me off at the beginning, but after playing, it absolutely became an actual positive point to the game. The combat mechanic works beautifully for it. And the only thing that I have against this game, or the only cons I have this game, was actually the balancing. There was a moment in the game that actually did stick out on stream because I spent several days trying to complete this level in particular. And that's because I think this game has a little bit of an issue balancing in this specific aspect. So the game has a total of six chapters and there is one chapter in particular, which is chapter three, which is the middle chapter, which is the most difficult chapter of them all. So of course there is a little bit of a balance there issue where you say, uh, shouldn't the last chapter be the difficult one? So let me elaborate a little bit more. In this regards, chapter 3 just works as you would expect chapter 3 to work. It is a little bit more difficult than chapter 2. The final boss of chapter 3, however, is absolutely insane. I had to try so many times to beat him and I actually reached the point where I had to reduce the difficulty to easy in order to actually beat him. That was how hard he was. So, of course, it does kind of um, make you feel frustrated because you want to learn more about the story but this single guy is not letting you advance. So that was the only only thing that I was kind of pissed off about but in a, in kind of a good way because even though I, I said pissed off it was really more annoyed than anything else. Overall this game is absolutely fantastic and I would 100% recommend it without a doubt. It is a fantastically crafted game. You can clearly tell that lots of effort has been put into the game, into the game story, and the developers are actually very, very active on Twitter. As a matter of fact, I was completely not expecting it the day that I announced that I was going to play Crying Sons. They actually liked my my publication, so obviously they are a very active community, capable, to, capable of actually detecting small streamers such as myself, saying stuff about their game. And as a matter of fact, I did pose a question on Twitter some time ago, which was directly directed at them, poor wording on my part there, sorry about that. 
And they actually answered in just a few minutes, so it, it is actually a very, very loving community that I really, really appreciate. So that said, would I recommend this game? Is this game worth it? Yes, yes it is, absolutely, without a doubt. So of course this is my personal opinion, maybe you don't like this style of games, so you wouldn't really like um, playing it, but of course as I said, this is my opinion, if you're watching this, maybe you are interested in the game, so I would probably say you should get it. So if you're thinking about getting it, where can you get it? Well, another thing that is a very strong pro for this game is that it's actually available on multiple platforms. You can actually get it on PC, mobile devices and Nintendo Switch. That last part is actually quite recent as I discovered on Twitter, they were announcing it quite recently that they were releasing it for Nintendo Switch. So if you have a Nintendo Switch, you can get it there now. So where can you get it on PC? Well, I can only recommend two main shops that probably uh, most people already know about, which are Steam and Epic. You can find it for $21.99 on Epic. I got it on Epic myself because that's where I found an offer to get it, so I got it because it was an offer mostly, giving it a good chance to discover the game. And on Steam you will find it for 20 99 which is one euro cheaper. So you can definitely have a look at that if you, have it on, if you want to have it on PC. On mobile devices you can find it on both Play Store and Google Play depending on what type of device you use. If you're using iOS devices and you want to get it on Play Store, you will have to pay 9.99 euros. If you have it on Android, and then it will just be 8.99, a little bit cheaper, just one euro cheaper. It's not that big of a deal, to be honest. And finally, if you have a Nintendo Switch and you're thinking about getting it, you can find it in the Nintendo eShop for 20.99, same price, same price that you will get on Steam. So this is a game that I would clearly mark as worth the price and worth the effort buying it. So if you're thinking about buying this game, if you like if you like roguelite games, if you like space games that are roguelite, I would definitely 100% recommend this game. So that said, I am going to end this video here. The next video I will release on this matter, we will start delving a little bit more into the lore. And we will start giving lore in little baby steps, similar to what the game did to me when I started playing it. So the first bit of lore we will look at will actually be related to the resources that we use, because they actually do have a little bit of lore attached to them. So that said, thank you everyone so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I would really appreciate it if you considered clicking that like button so I know that you liked watching it. And I will very, very much appreciate any type of feedback or comments that you could leave in the comment section below, as that will very much help me build a better video next time and just overall know your opinion and how to improve. So thank you so much in advance. If you just stumbled upon this video and haven't heard about me before, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel, that way you will be notified of next content that I make and it would really mean a lot to me. As well as this, as I have mentioned, I am a Twitch streamer. I do stream stuff on Twitch. I'm a very small streamer, to be honest, but I do enjoy it, and it is a very fun hobby for me. So I would really appreciate it if you considered coming over to my Twitch channel and chatting with me sometime. I only bite viewers sometimes and when I'm hungry, which is most of the time, usually, but I, I, will, I will try not to bite you, I, I promise. Maybe. So that said, thanks everyone for coming. And her. Bye.